We welcome him back, Christopher Hitchens, Vanity Fair. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being with us. And the author of this book, No One Left to Lie To. You talk about it inside the book. How'd you come up with this title? There's a guy, there was a guy, there is a guy, a good man called Dave Shippers, David Shippers, who was um, he's a Chicago Democrat, rather of the old school, uh, prosecutor, who was hired by Henry Hyde to be the chief counsel for the House Judiciary Committee. And in his summary speech, closing speech to the, to the impeachment uh, debate before the committee, he said, look, the president has now lied in a civil deposition, he's lied to a grand jury, he's lied to all his cabinet, he's lied to all his colleagues, to his family, to the American people, blah, blah, blah. There's no one left to lie to. And I was watching this. I had, a, I had an earlier title in mind for the book. It was even in the catalog already. But to, but the publishers were furious when, I, having seen this, I was watching it at Miami Airport on Airport TV. I thought that's got to be the title. It's perfect. What was the original title? It was going to be um, Ask Not, Tell Not. Why did you and your publisher select this picture for the cover? I had no idea until I sat down with the design people how many pictures there were of Clinton looking both smug and wicked and mendacious all at the same time. But that is almost the perfect one. And there's also a hint of triumph here in this one, as if he really does feel, I think that's everybody. I don't think there can be anyone left to lie to. And I say but that my book is addressed to all the people who wanted to be lied to um, and who still do. So in a way, he wins again until I can turn the tide. When I say the name Sidney Blumenthal, mm -hmm. what comes to mind? Old friend of mine. Um, unfortunately, also an old friend of Mr. Clinton's. And great admirer of and worker for. And alas, um, as he said to the Senate uh, when, in his testimony, um, one of those who was lied to. I mean, he realizes now that Mr. Clinton told him a full story about Monica Lewinsky and other matters and let him which shows what kind of a friend Mr. Clinton is, let him go into the grand jury and re retell this false and uh, defamatory story. Um, and the grand jury was me, and I was prepared to say as much uh, when asked by the House Judiciary Committee. And rather to my surprise, because um, Sidney had, had denied telling anyone else, it became a huge story. I mean, for a, it was a week-long flap which rather, I thought rather distracted attention from, um, from the main story, which was that the president had authored a, effectively um, a slander against a co former comfort woman of his for whom he had no further use. That's the kind of guy he is. That's what he quite often does. And had it circulated in such a way, I thought, as to um, constitute an obstruction of justice because it was a threat to her as well as a, as well as a slander of her. I can't find the quote in here, but uh -huh. in... in conversation that you had with Sidney Blumenthal. Marks, someone's been reading it closely. I, I have read it, actually. Mm -hmm. but, but, and I'm going to paraphrase. You, you allude to the fact that Sidney Blumenthal said, we're going to take care of Juanita Broderick. That's not exactly what you wrote, but uh, can no, you explain it was, what no, happened? It was, it was actually Kathleen Willey. Kathleen Willey, I'm sorry. Kathleen Willey. Well, I know it's hard to keep all these female victims in perspective, isn't it? I think I, I, can, I can now tell them apart, but it's, it's an effort. Um, Kathleen Willey, the week before I had my lunch with Sydney, Kathleen Willey had gone on 60 Minutes to say that she'd been the recipient of unwelcome attentions from the president. I thought she looked like she was telling the truth. I'd, I have heard since that she's been subjected to various kinds of intimidation from, of, a, of a sort of rather mysterious kind um, about it. Um, I, I brought it up with Sydney, or it came up at the lunch, and I remember him, he said that, well, her numbers are high now. You know, the, the polls had found people thinking she was credible, but they'll be down by the end of the week. And what had happened was, I didn't like the tone of it, you know, so that we'll, you know, we'll soon fix her kind of thing, but the following day, I think it was, the White House found and released all the private memos between her and the President. Some of them quite affectionate, you know, and admiring. She is, a, she is or was a very Clintonoid Democrat. Um, and what angered me about that, they found those and put them out in a day, more or less. Those had been subpoenaed not, not long before by the Paula Jones lawyers, those same memos, and any, they wanted any, any and all paper contact between the President and Ms. Willey. White House said, sorry, we just can't seem to find them. We just can't find them. You can subpoena us all you want. We can't put our hands on the papers. Once they needed to reply to 60 Minutes, though, they found the papers in short order. And that struck me as so typical of the MO of this White House. It's a 10th rate and nasty and um, underhand.
Midway like, like everything about, about this president and uh, his tactics. Midway through the book, you point out, first of all, that the president had precisely two cabinet meetings in 1998. Yeah, count them, two. One in January. To lie to the cabinet. And one in August. To tell him he was going to have to tell some bit of the truth, after all. And f sorry about that, guys. He didn't really say sorry, as a matter of fact. Um, he, de he, def he defended himself in a, the usual bombastic way when Donna Shalala said, well, you know, you could get the impression, Mr. President, that you just kind of put yourself ahead of, you know, all other considerations, your friends, your policies, your, all of that. You really were thinking only of yourself. He, he whirled on her and said, well, you're the sort of person who would have preferred Nixon to Kennedy. Why did he say that? Well, I think he, he'll say anything. That was the comment that was overheard afterwards. He'll say, he'll try anything. He's a complete solipsist, he's a, he has, um, and he's completely without scruple. But I think the consequences of the first meeting are the graver ones, because at the end of that meeting, whether, he, whether the cabinet were persuaded by his lying or not, I don't know, in their hearts, so to speak, but they were induced to go out into the street, uh, the vice president did and the secretary of state did, and make complete abject fools of themselves by saying they were absolutely sure he was telling the truth. Now, that's what everyone sees when they see Madeleine Albright coming to a negotiation now. You know, they see, oh, well, that, great, there's the woman who, who believed the president about Monica Lewinsky and went out and stood outside in the street and said, everything's fine. Nobody resigned. Only one person has resigned from this administration. It wasn't over any of these things. And it wasn't someone who'd been humiliated as these people were. You know, they've, lost, they've lost all their pride, all their dignity. And later in this... Uh chapter you say that I've known a number of people who work for him or with him and who have worked with this man they act like cult members while they are still under the spell and talk like ex cult members as soon as mm -hmm. they've broken away yes that's true um, George Stephanopoulos George is the one I, I know the best yeah I mean, I, I, it may be slightly unfair to say that he acted completely like a cult member while he was working there he was a, he's a relatively straight guy and, and rather decent I think but, you know, he had to often stand up for or defend impossible positions. He talks much, he, he talks much like an ex-cult member now he's left there. He, see, he talks like someone who will say, this is, you know, believe it or not, trust me, I used to believe this. This is how I used to think. And now, I can't imagine how I did, but I, I don't think it anymore. That was what made it familiar to me. And let me bring up one other point and then we'll get to calls. You he talk was, about the money. You were smiling, I encourage Well, I, I'm laughing. Uh, let me read this and then I'll uh, have okay. you follow up. You talk about David Geffen, Steven Spielberg of DreamWorks, who have contributed close to $400,000 and $236,000 to the Clintons of the Democratic Party, the Waltons of Walmart, $216,000, and Larry and Sheila Lawrence of the Hotel Del Coronado and their associated real estates, $100,000 of contributions by their companies or their employees to the President or the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. You go on to say that Mr. Lawrence later achieved a brief, brief celebrity by his triple crown of buying, lying, and dying. <laughs> Yeah. Explain. Well, he and his wife gave all this money and therefore they got into the Lincoln bedroom because, as you know, this president, let me put it like this, maybe because I'm an immigrant to this country, I'm, I perhaps am too easily overcome with reverence, but it seems to me one of the things about Clintonism is that it's, a, it's profaned, it's blasphemed by turning the uh, Oval Office into a sort of cheap uh, massage parlor, the Lincoln bedroom into a sort of cheap motel for fat cats, and Arlington Cemetery into something that can be franchised for fundraising. Mr. Lawrence um, invented a war record for himself so that, he could, so that he could, along with a hefty donation, have himself buried in Arlington Cemetery and he and his wife appointed to uh, diplomatic positions and so on. When it was all discovered that this had been a fraud um, and that the money shouldn't really have been handed over anyway, he had to be dug up out of Arlington Cemetery and reburied. Now that would get me down if, uh, if I was some a patriotic American, which I can't claim to be. Um, and I was appalled and rather astonished that it didn't get people down, that, that things that we're supposed to teach the children about now, the, the Lincoln bedroom, Mr. Lincoln's bedroom, for heaven's sake, used as a, as a motel, the Oval Office used as a massage parlor, and Arlington Cemetery used as a dump for lying fat cat fundraisers. This is, a, this is appalling, isn't it? And yet everyone said, but these are private matters. Leave the guy alone. Well, my impression is that now that it's over and he's walked, um, just literally walked, got clean away with everything and not apologized and said that he doesn't regard impeachment as a disgrace. The, the intent, that now people are turning away from him. And 
for reasons they can't quite explain, I, I have a lot of people come up to me now and say, you know, I didn't agree with you about this, or I don't agree with you about that, so, but when he comes on the TV now, I can't watch it anymore. So I'm really hoping that that's going to become general. And if he, ha if he can't be thrown out of office, at least people will turn their backs on him. The book is called No One Left to Lie to. Our guest is Christopher Hitchens, Del Mar, California, on our conservative line. Good morning. Good morning. I continue to be very troubled by the so-called trial that took place in the Senate. Um, I wonder if you can reveal anything to me why a Republican Senate would was so accommodating to the other side. I heard uh, Ms. Mr. Shippers, who I thought should have really done the trial, say that Joseph Biden, a Democrat who, from Robert Bork's saying, vetoed him. Uh, that why did Trent Lott allow this trial really not to take place? Even the Republican senators from Maine didn't want witnesses, live witnesses. I mean, it was, what, seven hours of videotape testimony of a president who I believe they all know is unfit to be there, and we probably wouldn't have this war if they had convicted him. Thanks, now, caller. Um, it's, I can, on the weekend after there was this row about my uh, testimony to the House uh, Judiciary Committee, I did get a call at home, as I've been told I might, from a, from a senator, a senior Democrat, a guy I actually quite admire, uh, I can't give his name, alas, but, um, who said that he, after what I'd said and other things that he'd learned, he was now determined that he would vote to convict on, uh, certainly on the count of obstruction of justice. I was, I was impressed. And then he began to talk about how, well, maybe the thing's been presented in too partisan a way. And I remember thinking, I wonder if he really is going to vote. That day. And of course, that day, to the lasting shame of the Democratic Party, he voted, not, not one single Democratic senator voted to, uh, to convict on the evidence, which was quite clearly preposterous. And that was the most noticeable thing, but the lady in question is quite right to say that there was a uh, mysterious lack of enthusiasm on the Republican side. I would, it would take a long time to explain all the reasons I think why that's true, but in effect, the, there had been a Clinton-Gingrich co-presidency until quite recently. The Republican Party had no real political quarrel with the president. The president, after all, was enacting most of their program and in the middle, indeed, of the, of the trial itself. He, in a step that I think, among other things, constitutes vote buying in the potential jury, announced that yes, after all, he is going to not just test but build the Star Wars, uh, the SDI system, the most expensive and destabilizing and dangerous and wasteful boondoggle in military, in political, in, indeed in political and economic history. So they were aware of that. They had the president where they wanted him. They said, okay, you enact our agenda. We might go easy on you. The second thing was that. The Republican Party knows how to watch Wall Street and the opinion polls as well as anybody else does, per perhaps a little better, certainly no worse. And it seemed to be the ruling of Wall Street and the Dow Jones and the opinion polls that, that impeachment was a waste of time or a, di or a diversion or at best. And at a meeting in um, Palm Beach of, I think it's called the Golden Eagles or some such, it's the Republican backers. I've sometimes heard it called the donor community, which always makes me laugh. They, the party had been told pretty much, you know, who cares about whether there's a crook as president? There are worse things than a crooked president if, if the guy knows, you know, what policies to pursue. Um, get with the program. This I, th quote, I think Trent Lott was capable of picking up that signal. This quote above the uh, title of the book, well-traveled, hyper-educated, pissed off, always funny. Is that how you describe yourself? The quote, we should point out, is from Voice Literary it's Supplement. It's from the, some very kind critic in the Village Voice who said that. Um, it wouldn't be for me to say, um, the pissed off bit I can, I can say is true. Um, if now I know that, which I didn't know until just this moment, that you can say pissed off at breakfast time on C-SPAN. <laughs> Boone, North Carolina, for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Uh, I have a question, uh, several questions, and mm. uh, some points I'd like to bring up. Uh, one of the questions, uh, kind of rhetorical, would be, uh, why is uh, Mr. Hitchens there wasting all his talents on uh, bashing uh, Mother Teresa and Bill Clinton? It's uh, pretty much a foregone conclusion. And uh, I saw... What, what's a foregone conclusion? conclusion? Well, <laughs> uh, it's, well it's, it's pretty obvious what, with uh, what we've got. Uh, we've just got to do the best with what we've got. And as far as Mother Teresa, you know, who cares? She did a job. But I saw you on Fox. And it uh, looks like Fox found the mother load of uh, 
all Clinton bashers. Uh, and uh, it seems as though uh, if Fox is going to use you, give uh, uh, give Fox 100 uh, percent, Chris Hitchin. Okay. And uh, one other point is the real reason why um, we're in Kosovo is probably because uh, the CIA uh, didn't support Panic and the State Department didn't support Panic. The uh, American millionaire who uh, was a, uh, a true Democrat, that's small d. Okay. Thanks, caller. That reminds me that I didn't answer the other lady's question about how, how impeachment might have um, averted this war. Could I just, I mean, I Certainly. could, I could uh, so try and comprehend both questions in the same answer. I don't believe, um, no, start again. In my book, I say that I do believe that the president used um, military force in a capricious and promiscuous way to save his own skin in Sudan last August, the bombings of Khartoum and of Kabul, and also later the uh, Christmas time or impeachment time bombings of um, Baghdad. I think I've made that case if, if you don't find it convincing, I can only say that so far no one, has re no one has rebutted or attempted to rebut this hypothesis. There's a great deal of evidence to show that the president, on his own initiative, used what should have been American military force for entirely private and corrupt purposes related to his own court calendar. It's the most shocking allegation to be made, I think, against the president. And the, the, the appalling fact that it's true hasn't sunk into people yet because I don't think they can quite take it, but they'll have to face it. Um, and of course it's conditioned the responses of other nations to any threat or promise made by the president because they know that at least they can suspect him of this, uh, which is not a healthy state of affairs. However, I think there was going to be a confrontation in Kosovo anyway. I don't believe for a moment the president engineered such a thing in this, in this matter. It, he, it no doubt suits him that he can pose as commander-in-chief while the Cox report on China is coming out and one or two other things such as very believable rape allegations are circulating. But I, I, I don't blame him for taking advantage of that. I mean almost any politician would, and it clearly suits him to do so. He's a lousy commander-in-chief, as you can see from the progress of the war. Not one of the things said by him about why it was being fought or how turned out to be true. But I don't think it's a wag-the-dog state of affairs. Mr. Panitch I've met. He was a Californian, is a Californian uh, Serb, successful businessman, and uh, funnily enough, old political friend and colleague of Jerry Brown's. And um, there was a time when it looked as if he might, if there was a fair election in former Yugoslavia, he might win. And he was opposed to the atrocities in Bosnia and the uh, totalitarian character of the Milosevic regime. And yes, it is a shame in a way he didn't get more support while he was a live candidate. We, we don't do anything to help the Serbian opposition. Christopher Hitchens grew up in South England, a graduate of Oxf Oxford University. Our next call is from Wichita Falls, Texas. Yeah, Good morning. I was there with the president. Were you? I, I was at Oxford at the same time. Yeah. Did you remember him? Did no. you meet him? I remember the house where he lived um, because it was the number of draft resistors were there. And I was a supporter of the anti-war movement. Was it Bodleian College? But, uh, of course, uh, Balliol was my college. Balliol. Uh, he, Mr. Clinton was at University College. 46 Lackford Road was where they, they used to hang out. And I used to go around and help dish out leaflets and that kind of thing. The president, unfortunately, turned out to be not a draft resistor, but a draft dodger, which is a quite different thing. I think never to be confused. Those who were, there were a lot of very brave young Americans in that stage who were prepared to take the consequences of opposing the war. One of the early signs of Mr. Clinton's lousy character was that he wasn't prepared to take those consequences. He just wanted to squeeze through and, not, and avoid the draft, which is not a creditable position to take. His roommate strobe Talbot. I remember Talbot. I remember Ira, Ira Magazine, and I remember quite well. I knew him. Uh, just my luck. Um, Robert Reich, strobe Talbot. Um, there were several, one or two others now I think about it. The name will come back to me. Let's get this uh, call from Texas yeah. if you think of it. Go ahead, caller. Thanks for waiting. Good morning. Mr. Hitchens, uh, I think you're about the lowest life. You have never liked this president. You've, uh, you've, ne I, I, you've never liked him. I want, I want to make a comment, and then I'll have a question. Uh, you have been from the very beginning on to this. You're a Jerry Brown fan and that kind of people. It doesn't matter who it is that you don't like. You run around the fox. You uh, do all these things, and you lie. You, you people like you have made a mint off of this president. You write books. You have no sources for it. You sitting there talking about it, you knew where he lived. Well, I'd like to see the picture. I'd like to see somebody tell me, besides people like you, I've been watching this, and I, grew, I, I, I used to live in West Memphis, Arkansas, by the way, so I know a little bit about Arkansas. I know a little bit about Paula Jones. 
and I know her relatives, and I know someone that works for the state who is named Paula. So, I mean, this old crap uh, uh, is a little tiring by now, and your books are running out, and I hope you don't sell one. Now, about Sidney Blumenthal, why, why do you want to go and get on to your friends and go on about all this crap? You people are just absolutely sickening. You, you, you can't do anything on your own. You don't cut, write real stories. You put out gossip and rumors about other people. You are sick. Okay, we'll get a response. Thanks, caller. Um, I quite often get asked if, if, if I've sort of got Clinton on the brain. You know, and in a way, I suppose I have. I mean, and that is partly because, as the lady says, I did, from the very first time I saw him in New Hampshire, I did think there was something revolting about him. Not something more than a political disagreement. In other words, I hated his politics and his dishonesty, but I thought there was something potentially monstrous about the guy. This was because, I don't know if you remember the case, but he, when he was in trouble in the polls over Jennifer Flowers and his lying about her, he went back to Arkansas, of which he was still governor, and supervised the execution of a mentally disabled, in fact, a lobotomized a black defendant called Ricky Ray Rector. A very cruel and cold and nasty attempt to sort of show that he could be a tough guy. And I was appalled by, the, by that, and also by the silence of the liberals about it. And I have, yeah, it's true, I have detested him ever since. What do you think of Mrs. Clinton? It, it may have upset, it may have, it, it may have made me sick, I don't know. The book is certainly in my mind an attempt to get him out of my system, but I think now I'll have to stick with it until the, the guy's gone one way or another, um, which isn't, thank heaven, that long now. As for the mint, in case anyone wonders, I mean, you try it. Um, I hope my publishers are listening. Uh, this is published by Verso, it's a small house that's the publishing arm of the New After Review. I, haven't, I don't think I've had an advance yet, and if I told you how much it was, you wouldn't believe anyway, because you'd think I was lowballing it. Mrs. Clinton, I've do met... You want, do you want to say the amount? I think it was five grand. Which it has to, you know, I, it has to make that back. So this is why I hope people are going to rush out and get it. Five thousand dollars to write this yeah. book, uh, Mrs. Not Clinton. Not. Mrs. Clinton. Um, well, I can't understand why people think she's owed a Senate seat. Somehow it seems that, after all she's done for us, we ought to find her a place in the Senate. I don't get this at all. What has she done for us except be the um, self-pitying, uh, robotic defendant of someone who is a pathological liar, almost certainly a rapist? And as I show in the book, a minor war criminal. All she's done is say that it's always someone else's fault. That plus, I suppose, single, very nearly single-handedly, took the work of many people over many years to build up a consensus on on national health coverage and universal health care, and just piss it away in a couple of months. So that now, there's no question in anybody's mind that the health care situation in the United States is much worse than when the Clintons were elected. Very much worse, steeply worse for the just both for the profession and for the patients because of the takeover of the whole healthcare business by the HMO racket. Probably one of the greatest single social disasters of the century. I don't see that she gets a Senate seat for that, do you? Fort Walton Beach, Florida, on our conservative line. Good morning. Uh, hello, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, I'm a conservative and I hope I'll be a contrast to your previous caller. Um, she sounded pretty conservative to me. Position on uh, Mr. Clinton, even though we uh, have different ideological views. Uh, my comment is, I would like to uh, ask your opinion or to get your comments on uh, the comparisons that have been made to what's going on in Kosovo. A lot of people have compared the situation in Kosovo to what's happened in, uh, in World War II and Hitler and also to the beginnings of uh, World War I. I think a more appropriate uh, comparison would be to what happened in Waco under Janet Reno and the um, the massacre of innocent people in, in that situation. Here you had a despotic individual that was uh, supposedly, or it was rumored, was conducting atrocities on the people that were under his control. And then you had uh, the government step in and with their uh, jack jackbooted thugs came in and actually massacred innocent people in an attempt to right the wrong that they were they were attempting to do and my other concern is the lack of response in the country for such a thing in other words there was no there appeared to be no outrage and i'd like you to get your comment on that please well um 
I don't think there's any comparison at all between Mr. Mr. Koresh and Mr. Milosevic, um, and presumably neither do you. I don't know. If, I don't know whether you intend the analogy to go that far, since you appear to think that Mr. Mr. Koresh was was um, innocent. I mean, I don't know that that's absolutely true. I think the the science that it wasn't a very nice organisation to belong to, especially if you were a kid uh, who hadn't had the option of joining. Uh, that's usually true of these cult groups, anyway. Doesn't excuse what the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, and Tobacco did, um, which, and as you say, it was what, a means by which we discovered that there was yet another um, armed and dangerous parastate force in the country that's entitled to come and kick down your door, as if there weren't enough of those already. So I'm with you so far, but Mr. Milosevic is, is everything that is said of him. I mean, you don't have to call him Hitler and all that kind of thing, but I was in Sar Sarajevo for a while, and I've, I've been in the region a fair bit, and I'm, I'm convinced myself that the, the charge that he's an aggressor and a racist and, uh, and a dictator and a war criminal are all absolutely solidly true. I, the, the tragedy for me of the present war is that it's not being fought for the advertised purpose. I mean, if, if the war aims were what we said they were, or what they were believed to be, namely to get the Kosovo refugees back home and Mr. Milosevic out of power, I would be impressed. But it, it seems to me that can't really be the objective. The objective seems more to, bo to boost the credibility, another overused word, of a, of a cumbersome and discredited NATO alliance. Westminster, Maryland, good morning on our moderate line. Moderate line? Good morning. Liberal, moderate, and conservative. I had no idea. Yeah. Go ahead, please. What about extremists? <laughs> Where are my friends? <laughs> I, I'm an ex-extremist. Ah. Yes, from the left. But uh, I consider myself a moderate now, comparatively speaking. Uh, I take Mr. Hitchens as being a part of a, a great tradition on uh, American television that began, I think, probably with Gore Vidal. Uh, That's too kind, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to accept it with grace. I have uh, a, a great deal of trouble with the ability of the American people to actually uh, sum up and get angry about Kosovo, its policy and its effect. If you looked at the uh, condition of the average Albanian Kosovar, as they call them, uh, uh, prior to the bombing and now, what have they won? I mean, their world has been lost, and I'm afraid that American policy, has, without, you know, without an exit strategy, has no way of getting them back. Mr. Milosevic has an exit strategy, though, doesn't he? I mean, or rather, an exodus strategy, and he's had one for a long time, and of course everybody knew that he was planning to do this. And that's what makes it so disgraceful. Mike Kelly did a very good column about this in the Washington Post a little while ago. He noticed the... Um, he noticed the press briefing given by uh, Prime Minister Massimo D'Alema of Italy, the new, the new Italian leader, who'd been in Washington a, a couple of weeks before the bombing. And he'd been to see the president because Italy's the frontline country. It's the nearest to Albania. That's where the air bases are. And that's where the refugees are going to try and head. If they can splash their way across from Bari, that's where Albanians always try and go. So in all those three ways, you know, Mr. D'Alema was entitled to ask you know, what the real plan was. And he said, in his briefing, so I asked the president, what will you do if we bomb? And it doesn't change Milosevic's policy, but he does turn on the Albanian Kosovo population, civilian population. Perfectly good question. I mean, anyone, he would have been a fool not to ask it. And he told the press that the president looked at him as if he was hearing the question for the first time, as if that thought had not occurred to him. And that he then turned to Sandy Berger. I'd hate to be in a position where I could only rely on Mr. Berger for advice, I must say. And said, well, what would we do, Sandy, in that situation? And Berger said, well, I guess we'd just keep on bombing. Well, this is outrageous. So they, 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 they then compounded this by saying, when the refugees were immediately kicked out in the hundreds of thousands and found on the hillsides of Macedonia and Albania, from the president and from the joint chiefs and from Mrs. Albright and Mr. Cohen, we were told, oh, don't, don't reproach us with that. We knew that was going to happen. We're not surprised by this. Well, we were expecting it. They were expecting it. What kind of an admission is that? That makes them accomplices in point of fact. Um, we, we have to hope for their sake that they're lying, because if they're telling the truth, then they would have to go to The Hague as well as Milosevic and, and be charged with complicity in crimes against humanity. The reason it's possible they are lying is that if they knew it was coming, then why were there no blankets and uh, pampers and food parcels and bottled water at the frontier? I mean, if they were expecting this flood of 
immiserated, homeless, terrified people. They certainly didn't look as if they'd made any provision for it. And then they said, well, I tell you what, since you have been kicked out, had, it, had your lives wrecked and all that, maybe we can have you live on a barbed wire encampment we've got in Cuba. I mean, as the caller just said, you know, you, if you didn't laugh, you'd have to cry, or you'd have to pretend that you hadn't noticed and just get on with your life. But the shame of this is unbelievable, it seems to me. Unbelievable shame. Go ahead, Silver Spring. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm a long-time viewer, and... Uh, 67-year-old African-American and a uh, retired Navy veteran of 25 years of uh, Korean and Vietnam War. And uh, Mr. Hitchens uh, fascinates me. <laughs> he really gets to the core of a lot of things. I voted for Clinton uh, twice, and I can't stand to watch him on TV. Uh, and I hate to say this, but as I am much a student of American history, I, I find him very much American, very much represents what this country is to a large degree. And I have no doubt in my mind that if he was in Milosevic's place, he would be just as ruthless and bloody. And uh, if he had it in his power, to really direct the armed forces doing his impeachment, I think he would have surrounded the Capitol building and probably rounded up all the Republicans and paraded them off somewhere. Paula, did and you vote for the president in either of the two elections? He said twice. Twice, I'm sorry, I missed that He said part. twice, twice too many. What, what, what turned the tide for you? Uh, just watching him on TV, his facial expressions, uh, his wiggle worming, what do you think of this picture on the cover of uh, Christopher Hitchens' new book? Yeah, that, 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 yeah, it almost nauseates me, and a lot of his facial expressions, uh, there's no doubt that he's a smart man, but, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I'm we'll, we'll get a response, thanks. I guess believe that O.J. was guilty, too, so, uh, me and my wife go around and around on these various <laughs> subjects, but uh, since I'm fully retired, uh, I'm a C-SPAN addict, and I watch it constantly, you know, and uh, I appreciate getting through to express my humble opinion. We're Thank glad you. to hear from you. We'll get uh, Christopher Hitchens' humble response. No, I, I, that's, it doesn't get any better than that. I think we should just let him speak for himself. Good man. Iva, South Carolina. Good, good morning. Good morning. I hate to disappoint the woman that called earlier, but I can't wait to go buy your book. Oh. I share every thought in your head. <laughs> yeah, let, but let, me just, let me ask you, about, you brought up a good point. Is this now at bookstores? Oh, yes. At fine bookstores everywhere. And what about Amazon.com or it Borders was number, Online? It was or number 15 on Amazon.com's uh, list yesterday, I was pleased to see. And how much is it, by the way? Well, I think that depends where you go buy it. My publishers are too, um, either too cheap or too slithery to actually put a price on the cover. but. Places like Barnes and Noble, I guess, discount books. I think it'll run you though about um, eighteen dollars. I think that's. I must say, I think that's rather a lot for such a small book. But, but if you don't like the president, um, it'll probably, it'll probably be worth it to you. And if you do, it'll certainly be worth it to you. Go ahead, caller. I'm sorry. If you do like the president, well, it's the best eighteen dollars you'll ever spend. So you'll spend eighteen dollars for this? Well, you yeah. could probably get it for fifteen. Well, shop around. I have distrusted him from or buy in the bulk. beginning, and. Thank you for your book, and I'll, I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you. No question, caller? Just a comment? She must have hung up. Phoenix, Arizona. Good morning for Christopher Hitchens. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment on one of the calls that uh, Mr. Hitchens received from the woman, and it was uh, with uh, great criticism. And I think it is typical of the non-thinking uh, liberal segment of the population. And I would further opine that uh, this country seems to be now run by uh, propaganda, fear, and paranoia. And Hello? Gone. Well, ne I would say next. Cleveland, Ohio. Good morning. Uh, as far as what you're stating, basically, you're only stating your views on all of this. I Don't state anyone else in. Have, hold, I can't hear you because I'm... Do you really have any facts to back anything? And secondly, I am a Democrat, and I do wonder... I've, 
uh, George W. Bush seems to be leading the pack by 50-some percent or whatever it is now. He hasn't said a word yet. How could these Republicans back up somebody that hasn't said anything? I think this is so stupid. When is, when is he going to open his mouth? Thank you. Thank you, caller. Do you ever notice how people sometimes will say when you've said something yourself? They'll say, well, that's only your opinion. And you think, well, yeah, I mean, that's true. Who else's opinion could it, could it possibly be? So, it's a tick. Some people do this. That's my reply to that. As to assertions of fact, yes, I do. And the book contains one or two of those. I mean, the most, uh, so to speak, um, damning or horrendous accusation I make against the president, which I've made elsewhere and, and on, in print and on the air, that he did wag the dog over Khartoum in August and, and Afghanistan in August and Iraq in December. I couldn't, I wouldn't, believe me, I'm not ducking your question, but um, I have put it out in print several times. No one has yet come up with, a, with the argument that disproves the evidence as I lay it out or the timeline as I lay it out. The way, for example, I'll give you one fact. The president wouldn't consult the Joint Chiefs about launching those missiles. He kept them out of the decision. He wouldn't, wouldn't talk to the CIA or the FBI as far as possible, made it a, a personal presidential matter of caprice, and thus hit the wrong target because there was no time to find out it was the wrong one. Um, and the reason for the hurry was that Ms. Lewinsky was due that day to go back to the grand jury. And things like that. Do you know how many people um, are f who've been asked to testify before the Senate committee on the campaign finance scandal, which may turn into the greatest scandal of all time if it turns out to be connected to the Chinese People's Republic's theft of uh, nuclear intelligence, which I think it is going to prove to be, by the way. Do you know how many people of the Clinton fundraising community were asked to come before that committee and either fled the country, became fugitives from justice, or or took refuge in the Fifth Amendment is a fact for you. 121. 121 people are currently refusing by one means or another to say what they know on the campaign finance question. That's a lot. That really is quite a lot of people. In fact, I think the, the political corruption of the electoral process has, has never been as boldly uh, practiced as by, by any administration as by this one or by any president as by this one. I wouldn't exempt even Richard Nixon from that judgment. We have a lot of emails. Let me go through a couple of them. One in uh, Tampa, Florida, G Gloria Blankley says, the lady insulting Mr. Hitchens is no better than the other enablers of this draft-dodging president. I'm finally hearing the truth about this man. Another says, there is no one I would rather listen to than Christopher Hitchens. I disagree with his political views, but he is so profoundly erudite, the William Buckley of the left. That from <laughs> Jay McCarthy of Marblehead, Massachusetts. Gore Vidal and William Buckley, to be called both in the same show, is this in the first half? Or are we past the... Uh, just about 40 minutes in. In the first 40 minutes, that's pretty good. That's make, that makes my day. Either one would have made my day, but both really does it. Thank you. I don't deserve it. Then we get this said, from hip, Jerry hip, hip, and hip, hip. Janice. Your guest is a buffoon. Ah. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. And there's this. Your guest of Vanity Fair makes me puke. Okay. No, but still. They can't take it away from me, the, other, the Vidal and Berkeley stuff. They just can't take it away from me. Surely, is that all they say? There, there's more, but we're going to get back to calls. Worcester, Massachusetts, for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Hitchens, uh, I have a question. Earlier you made the comment about uh, President Clinton uh, making a comment to Donna Shalala about her preferring Nixon over Johnson. And I just wanted to ask... Nixon over Kennedy. Over Kennedy, excuse me. I had a question... After the impeachment, his first press conference, Mr. Clinton uh, told the story about the man falling off the cliff and grabbing onto a branch. I wanted to know, because you know this administration, does he actually believe this when he says it and believe this when he says it to his cabinet members, or is he ch part of a strategy to infuriate his enemies or infuriate his critics so they'll speak out more against him, therefore his poll rating go up more? Do you have any comment on this? Well, it's a thing you have to ask yourself all the time about Clinton, because the, you, can't, you can't make, you can, you can only make, it's like the, the, what used to be called the Cretan paradox. The philosopher Zeno came up with saying all Cretans are, all, all men from Crete are liars. But what if you're told that by someone who is himself from Crete? Um, th is that statement still true if it's said by someone who's from Crete already? The Clinton paradox is the same. You wonder if he's lying even when you suspect he might be telling the truth. For example, he, uh, just on this matter of the impeachment and the trial, he said that he had never read the Star Report. He said that he never watched any of his own trial. 
Now, suppose those statements should be taken at face value. I mean, I suppose he wanted, that, he wa he wanted those statements to be believed. Why should he want people to believe that he didn't even trouble to read the document that had created all this fuss and that was the account of all the trouble that he, Clinton, had put everyone to? And isn't it astonishing that he would want us to believe that he wouldn't even watch his own trial by the United States Senate? That he, what was he doing instead? Playing golf? Um, having friend sex? We don't know. But I mean, he wanted us to believe that. And I, but I thought to myself, well, what does he take us for? Or what is he really like if he thinks those are clever remarks to make? So, and he does have a very lively sense of his own self-interest, and you can't say he's not good at manipulating public opinion and public opinion polls. But these just seem to me to be giveaways of a personality that's just deeply rotten. Does he know who you are? I don't think so. Ah, uh, well, I wonder now. He might. If you had the opportunity... I've never met him. I've met him. I've asked him a question in New Hampshire. I've asked him about this, this the lynching that he conducted of Ricky Ray Rector, but he turned his back on me and wouldn't answer that question. If you had the opportunity, would you ask him a question in a White House news conference? No. I don't go to those things. I, I'm, I mean, I've got a, a pass and so on, but I've stopped going because it's humiliating. I like this business tomorrow night at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. It's embarrassing as a member of the profession to go to these things now because you're being used as part of the furniture. You're, you're part of the effects, you're part of the, 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 uh, the props, the stage set. And it's degrading to go, I think. And, uh, uh, not that the president is in the habit of giving much in the way of press conferences this year. I mean, one of the many signs of the, the sort of banana republic kind of regime that he's been running is that he, he won't meet with the press unless he absolutely has to or unless he can shelter behind or drag in as a prop of some visiting dignitary who's worth 10 of him. Al Kamen writes about the dinner you just alluded to tomorrow night. We'll have coverage of the dinner, which our coverage gets underway at 9.30 East Coast time. Al Kamen writes, black tie, wires optional. Michael Isikoff is getting the Edgar Allan Poe Award from the White House Correspondents Association. And for a while, the president said that he was either not going to show up or travel somewhere else, like Littleton, Colorado, or an Air Force base in Europe, or sucking up and going. He's decided, according to Al Kamen, to suck it up and go but he will not be on hand for the award ceremony. Can you explain? Yeah, every year there's this terrible event at the Washington Hilton where, it's a, where the press grovels to the president and the president grovels to the press. It's a, it's a horrible thing to see. The president tries to show he's got a sense of humor. The press tries to show, uh, tries to disprove what's already obviously not true, namely that it, that it has an adversarial relationship to the president. <coughs> It's a humiliating evening, and lousy food and bad speeches, and worst of all, because the journalistic profession gives itself far too many of these as it is, prizes are handed out, like party favors. And Mike Isikoff, who is a very good reporter and has written a very good book, has got this prize. And I was trying to persuade him last week, he came to my book party in Los Angeles, that uh, he shouldn't go up to be given the prize by the president. He's got the award, that's an honor, if you like. There's a small check, put it in the bank. You don't have to go and be part of the stage management of this, this appalling liar and jerk. Um, and if it was a corporation, uh, Newsweek wouldn't let him do it, quite rightly. I don't know what he had decided, but now, unfortunately, Clint has decided for him that he's not going to be there to hand him the award. So it should have been Michael who said, I wouldn't, give, I wouldn't take it from the president anyway. Ventura, California. Good morning. Well, hi. Uh, m Mr. Hitchin, uh, I didn't uh, vote for the president uh, either time and uh, have never been much of a fan of the president. But if you compare this president and presidency with the other, the previous presidencies, and the kinds of things that happened inside those administrations and the kind of foreign policy that they used and the kind of economic policy that they used, uh, there's, you know, this one may have this odd style, but in the end, not a whole lot different, you know. Well, I can certainly see the force of that point, but I, I would, I'd add one observation, though, which is p part of the motive for my book. My book is, in a way, it's an address to American liberals and American liberalism. When Mr. Nixon and Mr. Reagan and Mr. Bush did the sort of things I imagine you have in mind, either at home or abroad, there was always a section of the population, quite a large one, in fact, in, and in the academy as well, and on, on campus, I mean by that, and um, in my profession, and elsewhere, who, who at least claimed they weren't taken in by it and were prepared to oppose it. With Mr. Clinton, however, enacting, for all practical purposes, a conservative Republican agenda, 
agenda is a word I hate, but there's no alternative to it. The liberals went quiet, they went dead, they couldn't criticize him. In fact, they often not just went quiet, but they noisily defended him w with completely preposterous and illogical syllogisms, such as, well, it's a private matter if he's corrupt. Um, it's his business. Um, it's no concern of ours. Um, everybody lies, they said, as if everybody lied in that way. Um, which meant that, the, that, in effect, there was no political opposition left in the country. Um, except the except the extreme right, or some of the extreme right, and the, and the religious right. Well, that that's a situation we've never been in before, where the consensus, <coughs> excuse me, a consensus has completely bodyguarded and absolutely an absolutely corrupt and worthless politician. So I thought that was that made it for me more serious. And so the book is a repast to all those who tried to carry the guy uh, when it was possible to have foreseen through him. Kauai, Hawaii, for Vanity Fair's Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so, you know, bear with me. <laughs> what time is it there? Um, I actually don't know. I, I kind of sit up and, and watch uh, C-SPAN a lot. <laughs> um, what I wanted to, to ask Mr. Hitchens was, um, why, does he have an opinion as to why is it that, that hate is like so, it, it's such a strong thing? I mean, I know I knew him from a long time ago. Um, you know, I used to admire him a lot and everything, but I, I feel like he's getting so consumed with it, and um, it's not good for him. You know, I I, I think that um, I don't know. I, I just I feel kind of bad for him. I feel bad for Bill Clinton. I feel bad for him. It's like the hatred is just it's making everybody do things that maybe ordinarily you know they wouldn't do, and it's going around so much. I mean, you hear it on talk radio shows and you know and I mean like it's, it's just I mean people could if they could just step back a little bit like Mr. Hitchens for instance if he could just step back I mean he, he, he brought it back to maybe the reason he, he hates Bill Clinton is from the time when he did that um the execution thing which I don't know the full story of but but I mean I just want to ask him you know I just want to ask him as a human being to another human being if he could try to you know just step back a little bit and um, kind of see other things about Bill Clinton. He's not a perfect person. He really is. He's very imperfect, but he does have good, you know, a, you know, a good side. Like everybody else, I'm sure he does. Mr. Hitchens, I'm sure you have some things that are good about you and some things oh, that are not perfect. I'd be glad to think so, certainly. As she says, she doesn't know about the Ricky Ray Rector case, the, the killing of this defenseless uh, and disabled man, but very few people do. Whereas um, if a Republican candidate had uh, tried to extricate himself from a, a tough primary by killing a, a lobotomized black man. I think the name of that man would be very well known by now, because among other things, the liberals in the press would have made a big stink about it. The appalling thing about Clinton is that he's been able to do these things and not be questioned by the, the liberal community, the liberal constituency. Sorry I'm not going to step back, um, ma'am. I can't oblige you. Uh, one, among other things, I have a book to sell, so I have to go out on the road with nothing but a smile and a shoe shine. Seattle, Washington, good morning. Hi, uh, I'm a little nervous. I've never uh, done nervous this before. People? So, um, I, it's I, a I nervous line. To no, no need to be nervous. Go ahead, caller. Well, I followed Mr. Hitchens for a long time as it's a nation and all that. And, uh, um, a good writer because he infuriates me one time and then I totally agree with him the other time. I, I do take umbrage at the uh, that description of Sister uh, Mother Trace uh, that you know, that, as the ghoul of Calcutta, I thought that was a bit much. But uh, as far as um, the uh, uh, this third way that uh, Mr. Clinton and Mr. Blair, whom I throw on the same boat, um, are are furthering, is this Kosovo and NATO agenda part of that? And does this third way uh. take into account the uh, cultural differences or? Is it in fact uh, their desire for a, a monoculture ol oligarchical type system that uh, overrides the cultural differences between people? Well, that make sense? yes, it does. Um, though I'm not absolutely certain what you. I think I'm going to make a guess as to what you mean by the second uh, point. But on the first one, I think it certainly is true of Mr. Blair who is politically, or you might say ideologically, sympathetic to Clinton and similar to him, though I don't really think Clinton has any ideology beyond his own selfishness and the needs of the hour. But 
call them a political twins if you like and the third way is the name they give to their project Mr. Blair, I think, has convinced himself over the question of Serbia and Kosovo that it is possible for people of his generation born since the Second World War, Mr. Blair is even younger than I am, uh, to um, fight a war that is definitely not motivated by self-interest or by empire or by any of the things that people used to suspect war of being motivated by, and that is international and legal and humanitarian. I mean, I think he thinks that that would be the achievement of his generation. So yes, that's... That's true, and I think he thinks it's true of this war, and I must say I think he's picked the wrong war to say this about. But one of the things that makes watching this nightmare in Kosovo so, so appalling is precisely that you can't say that the war is being fought for a purpose that is, as advertised, ignoble. As advertised, the purpose is a noble one. That, that's pessima corruptio optimi. They, I was taught when I was, was taught Latin, which I know I don't remember much of, it means the worst. Is, is the corruption of the best. If you were to write a profile of Christopher Hitchens, which adjectives would you use to describe him? I really don't think that's a fair question. I mean, um, you'd have to ask somebody else. Um, but I hope, well, no, I'm not even sure I should say what I hope would be said. Can't do it. Can't were, do it. were you really up all night? I was up a lot of the night. Why? Um, I've been, I've had a lot of work to catch up on, there's a lot of work I've got to do before I can go off on the road, which I'm about to do, I'm about to set off on a little tour of the country beating the bushes, the smile and the shoe shine are coming into play. When do you work best? Late at night, as a matter of fact, probably a shame, that. Children are asleep, phone doesn't ring, it's quiet, except for the, you know, screams and gunshots and things like that. In the book? I, I like to work then. The book dedicated to Laura and Sophia? Yes, my daughters. How old are they? Sophia will be ten this year, and Antonio will be six. Pensacola, Florida, good morning. Yes, hello. Uh, I won't turn this on mute. Uh, I, I, won't, uh, I would like for you to give me uh, uh, one statement that uh, Clinton has said to you that you could say he is a direct liar. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, at Oxford or wherever, one statement he is, is said directly to you. To me personally? You're, beg your pardon? To me personally, you mean? Beg your pardon? To me personally, sir. Yes, do you personally, you say you've known him since Oxford. You, no. know, you know him back when he was in Oxford. I no, mean, I... even back then, can you tell me one, one uh, no, I think I may have I may have let you get the wrong impression. Um, I very carefully said I did not know him at Oxford. I, I'm contemporary of his from there. I knew other people who lived at his address, other contemporaries of his, American and, and British, and so on. But I've never met the guy except for once in New Hampshire where he wouldn't answer a question I asked him about the, I thought, judicial murder of um, Ricky Ray Rector. It was funny, too, because he was looking very much for a change of subject from Jennifer Flowers which was all that my colleagues would care about. And I thought, as a test of character, surely executing a lobotomized black man is a more, more strenuous test, more interesting test than, than lying about Jennifer Flowers. So anyway, I said, well, uh, Governor, I do have another subject. And he sort of turned as if that would be nice. And I asked him about this, and he just turned his back and walked away. It was on the tarmac at some airport in New Hampshire. Chicago, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Hitchens. Good morning. Um, I've, I've watched you over the last year and a half or whatever, and I have to admit I disagree with most things that you say, but mm. I respect uh, the way you stick to your guns. And you. I would like to see perhaps with your very direct acerbic form of journalism using that in maybe a little bit more positive way, highlighting other things. But I think you certainly yourself and also Mr. William Bennett, who I used to completely disagree with, I think a lot of things you've said we're actually now seeing have turned out to be true. I'm not talking about rapists or war criminals. I think that's a little bit below your intellectual level, to be quite honest with you. But anyhow, yeah. my question to you is uh, about the Kosovo crisis. Two very quick questions. What about this double standard in the Rambouillet Agreement, where one of the uh, stipulations is that the Kosovo Liberation Army is supposed to be de-armed or unarmed, and yet we have the Western media now eulogizing them that now there are 20,000 people and whatever. And I've been feeling the Kosovo Liberation Army is just doing the dirty work for Clinton. He doesn't have the moral strength to send the troops in. 
I think he does a dis an, an injustice to the troops because I'm sure the Marines, the British paratroopers, the French Foreign Legion, they would go in there seeing what's going on. Caller, I'm going to stop you on that note because we are short on time and we'll get a response from our guest. Thanks for the call from Chicago. Um, the Kosovo Liberation Army, I know very little about. I don't think anyone, I don't trust anyone who says they do know it well. Allegations have been made against it that it's an extreme Leninist organization, that it's an extreme uh, Islamic organization, and that it's a drug dealing and uh, narcotic uh, smuggling organization. I don't know of any evidence for any of those three propositions, and I know that um, a lot of what is said about, about KLA is slanderous, but I have a suspicion that th there's an accusation you could make against it that would be true, which is that it's an extreme irredentist nationalist organization, by which I mean to say that it wants, in the end, Kosovo to become part of a greater Albania. And I think that the metastasis of the vile idea of Milosevic, greater Serbia, a state based on ethno-fascism internally and towards its neighbors, the metastasis of that will be greater Albania. It'll be Milosevic's fault, uh, but it won't be a pretty thing to see. And I think Western policy should, should be predicated on the idea that greater Albania would be a bad idea too, just as greater Serbia is. Jacksonville, Florida. So you're right, there is an imbalance, yes. Good morning for Christopher Hitchens. Yes, sir. I'd like to say thank you, Mr. Hitchinson, for uh, writing the book. Oh. I do have two comments for you, sir. Um, one, I'd like to find out what you know of the Ford Foundation and if you believe that the Clinton administration is involved with it. I've read several books throughout the years uh, on that subject of uh, a government, uh, a larger government issue behind the, uh, behind the scenes. And also, I'd like to correct Mr. Kelly, who was on before you, who said that there are only about 10, 12,000 people in the area of both Iraq and the, Kosnia, and the Kosovo area. But uh, the fact is, is that there's better than 50,000 people that are deployed from the United States over there right now. Military personnel. A firm. That okay. From, from the actual United States, pre-deployed, not stationed overseas. There's better than 50, almost 75,000 involved. And I believe it was just the other day you had uh, Representative Gilman on, on talking, and he said that the war in, over there over in Iraq is, um, has been, is over. And I will hate to tell you this, and the people of America do need to know this, your military is still out there on the line every day flying over these countries, and nobody believes the war is over, even though we're not bombing every day as we are now in Kosovo. Appreciate the call. Thank you. I can't help him on the Ford Foundation. I have no, I have, I'm sorry, sir. I have no information on that. What is triangulation? Triangulation is three-card Monty, really. It's a fancy name for three-card Monty. Um, it's a name... The fancy name is coined by Dick Morris, a sleazy political consultant, ultra-conservative, um, used to work for Jesse Helms, unscrupulous money man and bag man and occasional procurer of women also for the president and until recently his only male friend. Um, the idea of triangulation as a strategy is this, you, you steal the Republican Party's uh, program, adopt it for the Democratic Party, hope you can bring the donors along, the Republican Party's donors along with you, which you often can. Then you're faced with the task of shoring up or reassuring your own constituency and that's done by means of a sort of cheap and superficial political correctness, uh, by which I mean Mr. Clinton was very good at going to different constituencies and suggesting that they wouldn't be safe if there was a Republican majority, to women about abortion, for example, to some civil libertarians about the Supreme Court. He's very good at resorting to that kind of thing when, in a corner, for example, on this China scandal, which I think still might be the death of him, if half of what we suspect is true. His first response is to say, but this is just Asian bashing. Now, no one had done any Asian bashing. There was no suggestion at all. There wasn't, I think, even an undertone of chauvinism in the pointing out that a lot of Mr. Clinton's donors were acting for foreign powers and major Asian foreign corporations. Immediately, he turns it into an, before anyone said anything, well, this is Asian bashing, as if to appeal to, you know, a, a latent uh, rainbow coalition. Um, that's the way the trick is pulled, and that's... That's where triangulation gets you in the end, by the way. As you may know, we're spending a lot of time on this network looking at uh, the 41 men who have served in the White House, 41 American presidents, 42, but one served not consecutive terms. What is a fair amount of time in order to judge President Clinton through the prism of history? Oh, I think his place in history is secure already, don't you? 
I mean, I, I really don't think that there can be much doubt about it, it that people will say his was a regime of nothingness punctuated by nastiness. Uh, eight years eaten by the locust. Um, uh, the time when the possibility of denuclearizing and disarming large parts of the world, who's the first real post-Cold War president, was simply thrown away. With a chance to rebuild a different relationship with Russia was thrown away in the same way, where the most sordid imaginable relationship was, however, developed with China, in the most cynical possible manner. Where um, the, the worst kinds of political uh, um, trickery were practiced, uh, where the healthcare argument was lost perhaps for a whole other generation. And where the standard of public life and of what, what can be expected of a public servant was allowed just to collapse in free fall. You know, nothing was punctuated by nastiness. Is what it was. You don't need to wait for a verdict on Mr. Clinton. The book, No One Left to Lie to, by Christopher Hitchens, now out published by... Verso, V-E-R-S-O. Thank you very much for being with us. No, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We welcome him back, Christopher Hitchens, Vanity Fair. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being with us. And the author of this book, No One Left to Lie To. You talk about it inside the book. How'd you come up with this title? There's a guy, there was a guy, there is a guy, a good man called Dave Shippers, David Shippers, who was um, he's a Chicago Democrat, rather of the old school uh, prosecutor, who was hired by Henry Hyde to be the chief counsel for the House Judiciary Committee. And in his summary, speech, closing speech to the, to the impeachment uh, debate before the committee. He said, look, the president has now lied in a civil deposition. He's lied to a grand jury. He's lied to all his cabinet. He's lied to all his colleagues, to his family, to the American people. Blah, blah, blah. There's no one left to lie to. And I was watching this. I had, a, I had an earlier title in mind for the book. It was even in the catalog already. But to, but the publishers were furious when, I, having seen this, I was watching it at Miami airport on airport TV. I thought that's got to be the title, it's perfect. What was the original title? It was going to be um, Ask Not, Tell Not. Why did you and your publisher select this picture for the cover? I had no idea until I sat down with the design people how many pictures there were of Clinton looking both smug and wicked and mendacious all at the same time. But that is almost the perfect one. And there's also a hint of triumph here in this one, as if he really does feel, I think that's everybody. I don't think there can be anyone left to lie to. I say but my book is addressed to all the people who wanted to be lied to, I and mean, who still do. So, in a way, he wins again until I can turn the tide. When I say the name Sidney Blumenthal, mm -hmm. what comes to mind? Old friend of mine. Um, unfortunately, also an old friend of Mr. Clinton's. I'm a great admirer of and worker for. And alas, um, as he said to the Senate uh, when, in his testimony, um, one of those who was lied to. I mean, he realizes now that Mr. Clinton told him a full story about Monica Lewinsky and other matters, and let him, which shows what kind of a friend Mr. Clinton is, let him go into the grand jury and re retell this false and uh, defamatory story. Um, the grand jury was me, and I was prepared to say as much uh, when asked by the House Judiciary Committee. And rather to my surprise, because um, Sidney had, had denied telling anyone else, it became a huge story. I mean, for a, it was a week-long flap, which rather, I thought rather distracted attention from, um, from the main story, which was that the president had authored a, effectively um, a slander against a co former comfort woman of his for whom he had no further use. That's the kind of guy he is. That's what he quite often does. And had it circulated in such a way, I thought, as to um, constitute an obstruction of justice because it was a threat to her as well as a, as well as a slander of her. I can't find the quote in here, but uh -huh. in, in the conversation that you had with Sidney Blumenthal... Marks, someone's been reading it closely. I, I have read it, actually. Mm -hmm. but, but, and I'm going to paraphrase. You, you allude to the fact that Sidney Blumenthal said, we're going to take care of Juanita Broderick. That's not exactly what you wrote, but uh, can no, you explain was, uh, what no, happened? No, it was actually Kathleen Woolley. Kathleen Woolley, I'm sorry. Kathleen Woolley. Well, I know it's hard to keep all these female victims in perspective, isn't it? I think I, I, can, I can now tell them apart, but it's, it's an effort. Um, Kathleen Willey, the week before I had my lunch with Sydney, Kathleen Willey had gone on 60 Minutes to say that she had been the recipient of unwelcome attentions from the president. I thought she looked like she was telling the truth. 
I'd, I have heard since that she's been subjected to various kinds of intimidation from of a, of a sort of rather mysterious kind um, about it. Um, I, I brought it up with Sidney, or it came up at the lunch, and I remember him, he said that, well, her numbers are high now. Have, you know, the, the polls had found people thinking she was credible, but they'll be down by the end of the week. And what had happened was, I didn't like the tone of it, you know, so that we'll, you know, we'll soon fix her kind of thing, but the following day, I think it was, the White House found and released all the private memos between her and the president, some of them quite affectionate, you know, and admiring. She is, a, she is or was a very Clintonoid Democrat. Um, and what angered me about that, they found those and put them out in a day, more or less. Those had been subpoenaed not, not long before by the Paula Jones lawyers, those same memos, and any, they wanted any, any and all paper contact between the president and Ms. Willie. White House says, sorry, we just can't seem to find them. We just can't find them. You can subpoena them. Thanks for waiting. Good morning. Mr. Hitchens, uh, I think you're about the lowest life. You have never liked this president. You've, uh, you've, ne uh, uh, you've never liked him. I want, I want to make a comment, and then I'll have a question. Uh, you have been from the very beginning onto this. You're a Jerry Brown fan and that kind of people. It doesn't matter who it is that you don't like. You run around the Fox, you uh, do all these things, and you lie. You, you people like you have made a mint off of this president. You write books. You have no sources for it. You sitting there talking about you knew where he lived. Well, I'd like to see the picture. I'd like to see somebody tell me. Besides people like you, I've been watching this, and I grew. I, I, I used to live in West Memphis, Arkansas, by the way. So I know a little bit about Arkansas. I know a little bit about Paula Jones. And I, I know her relatives. And I know someone that works for the state who is named Paula. So, I mean, this old crap uh, uh, is a little tiring by now. And your books are running out. And I hope you don't sell one. Now, about Sidney Blumenthal. Why, why do you want to go and get on to your friends and go on about all this crap? You people are just absolutely sickening. You, you, you can't do anything on your own. You don't cut, write real stories. You put out gossip and rumors about other people. You are sick. Okay, we'll okay. get a response. Thanks, caller. Um, I quite often get asked if, if, if I've sort of got Clinton on the brain. You know, and in a way, I suppose I have. I mean, and that is partly because, as the lady says, I did, from the very first time I saw him in New Hampshire, I did think there was something revolting about him. Not something more than a political disagreement. In other words, I hated his politics and his dishonesty, but I thought there was something potentially monstrous about the guy. This was because, I don't know if you remember the case, but he, when he was in trouble in the polls over Jennifer Flowers and his lying about her, he went back to Arkansas, of which he was still governor, and supervised the execution of a mentally disabled, in fact a lobotomized uh, black defendant called Ricky Ray Rector. A very cruel and cold and nasty attempt to sort of show that he could be a tough guy. And I was appalled by, the, by that and also by the silence of the liberals about it and I have, yeah it's true, I have detested him ever since. What uh, do you think of may, Mrs. Clinton? It, it may have upset, it may have, it, it may have made me sick, I don't know. The book is certainly in my mind an attempt to get him out of my system but I think now I'll have to stick with it until the, the guy's gone one way or another, um, which isn't, thank heaven, that long now. As for the Mint, in case anyone wonders, I mean, you try it. Um, I hope my publishers are listening. Uh, this is published by Verso, it's a small house that's the publishing arm of the New After Review. I, haven't, I don't think I've had an advance yet, and if I told you how much it was, you wouldn't believe anyway, because you'd think I was lowballing it. Mrs. Clinton, I've do met... You want, do you want to say the amount? I think it was five grand. Which it has to, you know, I, it has to make that back. So this is why I hope people are going to rush out and get it. Five thousand dollars to write this yeah. book, uh, Mrs. Not Clinton. A lot. Mrs. Clinton. Um, well, I can't understand why people think she's owed a Senate seat. Somehow it seems that, after all she's done for us, we ought to find her a place in the Senate. I don't get this at all. What has she done for us except be the um, self-pitying, uh, robotic defendant of someone who is a pathological liar, almost certainly a rapist? And, as I show in the book, a minor war criminal. All she's done is say that it's always someone else's fault. That plus, I suppose, single, very nearly single-handedly took the work of many people over many years to build up a consensus on, on national health coverage and universal health care and just piss it away. 
in a couple of months. So that now there's no question in anybody's mind that the healthcare situation in the United States is much worse than when the Clintons were elected. Very much worse, steeply worse for the just both for the profession and for the patients because of the takeover of the whole healthcare business by the HMO racket. Probably one of the greatest single social disasters of the century. I don't see that she gets a Senate seat for that, do you? Fort Walton Beach, Florida, on our conservative line. Good morning. Uh, hello, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, I'm a conservative, and I hope I'll be a contrast to your previous caller. Um, you sounded pretty conservative to me. Position on uh, Mr. Clinton, even though we uh, have different ideological views. Uh, my comment is I would like to uh, ask your opinion or get your comments on... Uh, I have a question, uh, several questions, and uh, some points I'd like to bring up. Uh, one of the questions, uh, kind of rhetorical, would be uh, why is uh, Mr. Hitchens there wasting all his talents on uh, bashing uh, Mother Teresa and Bill Clinton? It's uh, pretty much a foregone conclusion. And uh, I saw... What, what's a foregone conclusion? conclusion? Well... <laughs> Uh, it's, well, it's, it's pretty obvious what, with uh, what we've got. Uh, we just got to do the best with what we've got. And as far as Mother Teresa, you know, who cares? She did a job. But I saw you on Fox, and it uh, looks like Fox found the mother load of uh, all Clinton bashers. Uh, and uh, it seems as though uh, if Fox is going to use you, give, uh, uh, give Fox 100% uh, Chris Hitchin. Okay. And uh, one other point is the real reason why um, we're in Kosovo is probably because uh, the CIA uh, didn't support Panic and the State Department didn't support Panic. The uh, American millionaire who uh, was a, uh, a true Democrat, that's a small d. Okay. Thanks, caller. That reminds me that I didn't answer the other lady's question about how, how impeachment might have um, averted this war. Could I just... I mean, I Certainly. Could, I could, uh, so try and comprehend both questions in the same answer. I don't believe, um, no, start again. In my book, I say that I do believe that the president used um, military force in a capricious and promiscuous way to save his own skin in Sudan last August, the bombings of Khartoum and of Kabul, and also later the uh, Christmas time or impeachment time bombings of um, Baghdad. I think I've made that case. If, if you don't find it convincing, I can only say that so far no one, has re no one has rebutted or attempted to rebut this hypothesis. There's a great deal of evidence to show that the president, on his own initiative, used what should have been American military force for entirely private and corrupt purposes related to his own court calendar. It's the most shocking allegation to be made, I think, against the president. And the, the, the appalling fact that it's true hasn't sunk into people yet because I don't think they can quite take it, but they'll have to face it. Um, and, of course, it's conditioned the responses of other nations to any threat or promise made by the president because they know that at least they can suspect him of this, uh, which is not a healthy state of affairs. However, I think there was going to be a confrontation in Kosovo anyway. I don't believe for a moment the president engineered such a thing in this, in this matter. It, he, it no doubt suits him that he can pose as commander-in-chief while the Cox report on China is coming out and one or two other things such as very believable rape allegations are circulating. But I, I, I don't blame him for taking advantage of that. I mean, almost any politician would, and it clearly suits him to do so. He's a lousy commander-in-chief, as you can see from the progress of the war. Not one of the things said by him about why it was being fought or how turned out to be true. But I don't think it's a wag-the-dog state of affairs. Mr. Panich I've met. He was a Californian, is a Californian uh, Serb, successful businessman, and uh, funnily enough, old political friend and colleague of Jerry Brown's. And um, there was a time when it looked as if he might, if there was a fair election in former Yugoslavia, he might win. And he was opposed to the atrocities in Bosnia and the uh, totalitarian character of the Milosevic regime. And yes, it is a shame in a way he didn't get more support while he was a live candidate. We, we don't do anything to help the Serbian opposition. Christopher Hitchens grew up in South England, a graduate of Oxf Oxford University. Our next call is from Wichita Falls, Texas. Yeah, Good I morning. I was there with the president. Were you? I, I was at Oxford at the same time. Yeah. Did you remember him? Did no. you meet him? I remember the house where he lived um, because it was the number of draft resistors were there. And I was a supporter of the anti-war movement. Was it Bodleian College? But, uh, was, of course, uh, Balliol was my college. Balliol. Uh, he, Mr. Clinton was at University College. 46 Lackford Road was where they, they used to hang out. And I used to go around and help dish out leaflets and that kind of thing. The president, unfortunately, turned out to be not a draft resistor, but a draft dodger, which is a quite different thing. I think never to be confused. Those who were 
There were a lot of very brave young Americans at that stage who were prepared to take the consequences of opposing the war. One of the early signs of Mr. Clinton's lousy character was that he wasn't prepared to take those consequences. He just wanted to squeeze through and, not, and avoid the draft, which is not a creditable position to take. His roommate strobe Talbot? And I remember Talbot. I remember Ira Magazine, and I remember quite well. I knew him. Uh, just my luck. Um, Robert Reich, strobe Talbot. Um, there were several, one or two others now I think about it. The name will come back to me. Let's get uh, this call from Texas yeah. if you think of it. Go ahead, caller. Thanks. The office used as a massage parlor, and Arlington Cemetery used as a dump for lying fat cat fundraisers. This is, a, this is appalling, isn't it? And yet everyone said, but these are private matters. Leave the guy alone. Well, my impression is that now that it's over and he's walked, um, just literally walked, got clean away with everything and not apologized and said that he doesn't regard impeachment as a disgrace, the, the that now people are turning away from him. And uh, for reasons they can't quite explain, I, I have a lot of people come up to me now and say, you know, I didn't agree with you about this or I don't agree with you about that, so, but when he comes on the TV now, I can't watch it anymore. So I'm really hoping that that's going to become general. And if he, if he can't be thrown out of office, at least people will turn their backs on him. The book is called No One Left to Lie to. Our guest is Christopher Hitchens, Del Mar, California, on our conservative line. Good morning. Good morning. I continue to be very troubled by the so-called trial that took place in the Senate. Um, I wonder if you can reveal anything to me why a Republican Senate would was so accommodating to the other side. I heard uh, Ms. Mr. Shippers, who I thought should have really done the trial, say that Joseph Biden, a Democrat who, from Robert Bork fame, vetoed him. Uh, that why did Trent Lott allow this trial really not to take place? Even the Republican senators from Maine didn't want witnesses, live witnesses. I mean, it was, what, seven hours of videotaped testimony of a president who I believe they all know is unfit to be there, and we probably wouldn't have this war if they had convicted him. Thanks, now, caller. Um, it's, I can, on the weekend after there was this row about my uh, testimony to the House uh, Judiciary Committee, I did get a call at home, as I've been told I might, from a, from a senator, a senior Democrat, a guy I actually quite admire, uh, I can't give his name, alas, but um, who said that he, after what I'd said and other things that he'd learned, he was now determined that he would vote to convict on, uh, certainly on the count of obstruction of justice. I was, I was impressed. And then he began to talk about how well maybe the thing's been presented in too partisan a way. And I remember thinking, I wonder if he really is going to vote. That day. And of course, that day, to the lasting shame of the Democratic Party, he voted, not, not one single Democratic senator voted to, uh, to convict on the evidence, which was quite clearly preposterous. And that was the most noticeable thing. But the lady in question is quite right to say that there was a uh, mysterious lack of enthusiasm on the Republican side. I would, it would take a long time to explain all the reasons I think why that's true. But in effect, the, there had been a Clinton-Gingrich co-presidency until quite recently. The Republican Party had no real political quarrel with the president. The president, after all, was enacting most of their program and in the middle, indeed, of the, of the trial itself. He, in a step that I think, among other things, constitutes vote buying in the potential jury, announced that yes, after all, he is going to not just test but build the Star Wars, uh, the SDI system, the most expensive and destabilizing and dangerous and wasteful boondoggle in military, in political, in, indeed in political and economic history. So they were aware of that. They had the president where they wanted him. They said, okay, you enact our agenda, we might go easy on you. The second thing was that. The Republican Party knows how to watch Wall Street and the opinion polls as well as anybody else does, per perhaps a little better, certainly no worse. And it seemed to be the ruling of Wall Street and the Dow Jones and the opinion polls that, that impeachment was a waste of time or, a di or a diversion or at best. And at a meeting in um, Palm Beach of, I think it's called the Golden Eagles or some such, it's the Republican backers. I've sometimes said it called the donor community, which always makes me laugh. They, the party had been told pretty much, you know, who cares about whether there's a crook as president? There are worse things than a crooked president if, if the guy knows, you know, what policies to pursue. Um, get with the program. This I, th quote, I think Trent Lott was capable of picking up that signal. This quote above the uh, title of the book, well-traveled, hyper-educated, pissed off, always funny. Is that how you describe yourself? 
The quote, we should point out, is from Voice Literary it's Supplement. It was some very kind critic in the Village Voice who said that. Um, it wouldn't be for me to say. Um, the pissed off bit, I can, I can say, is true. Um, if now I know, that, which I didn't know until just this moment, that you can say pissed off at breakfast time on C-SPAN. <laughs> Boone, North Carolina, for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. That's all you want. We can't put our hands on the papers. Once they needed to reply to 60 Minutes, though, they found the papers in short order. And that struck me as so typical of the MO of this White House. It's a tenth rate and nasty and um, underhand. Midway like, like everything about, about this president and uh, his tactics. Midway through the book, you point out, first of all, that the president had precisely two cabinet meetings in 1998. Yeah, count them, two. One in January. To lie to the cabinet. And one in August. To tell him he was going to have to tell some bit of the truth after all, and f sorry about that, guys. He didn't really say sorry, as a matter of fact. Um, he, de he, def he defended himself in a, the usual bombastic way when Donna Shalala said, well, you know, you could get the impression, Mr. President, that you just kind of put yourself ahead of, you know, all other considerations, your friends, your policies, your, all of that. You really were thinking only of yourself. He, he whirled on her and said, well, you're the sort of person who would have preferred Nixon to Kennedy. Why did he say that? Well, I think he, he'll say anything. That was the comment that was overheard afterwards. He'll say, try anything. He's a complete solipsist. He's a, he has, um, and he's completely without scruple. But I think the consequences of the first meeting are the graver ones, because at the end of that meeting, whether, he, whether the cabinet were persuaded by his lying or not, I don't know, in their hearts, so to speak, but they were induced to go out into the street, uh, the vice president did and the secretary of state did, and make complete abject fools of themselves by saying they were absolutely sure he was telling the truth. Now, that's what everyone sees when they see Madeleine Albright coming to a negotiation now. You know, they see, oh, well, that, great, there's the woman who, who believed the president about Monica Lewinsky and went out and stood outside in the street and said, everything's fine. Nobody resigned. Only one person has resigned from this administration. It wasn't over any of these things. And it wasn't someone who'd been humiliated as these people were. They've lost They've lost all their pride, all their dignity. Later in this uh, chapter, you say that I've known a number of people who work for him or with him and who have worked with this man. They act like cult members while they are still under the spell and talk like ex-cult members as soon as mm -hmm. they've broken away. Yes, that's true. Um, George Stephanopoulos? George is the one I, I know the best, yeah. I mean, I, I, it may be slightly unfair to say that he acted completely like a cult member while he was working there. He was a, he's a relatively straight guy, and, and rather decent, I think. But, you know, he had to often stand up for or defend impossible positions. He talks much, he, he talks much like an ex-cult member now he's left there. He, see, he talks like someone who will say, this is, you know, believe it or not, trust me, I used to believe this. This is how I used to think. And now, I can't imagine how I did but I, I don't think it anymore. That was what made it familiar to me. And let me bring up one other point and then we'll get to calls. You he talk was, about the money. You were smiling, I encourage Well, I, I'm laughing. Uh, let me read this and then I'll okay. have you follow up. You talk about David Geffen, Steven Spielberg of DreamWorks who have contributed close to $400,000 and $236,000 to the Clintons of the Democratic Party, the Waltons of Walmart, $216,000, and Larry and Sheila Lawrence of the Hotel Del Coronado and their associated real estates, $100,000 of contributions by their companies or their employees to the President or the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. You go on to say that Mr. Lawrence later achieved a brief, brief celebrity by his triple crown of buying, lying, and dying. Yeah. Explain. Well, he and his wife gave all this money and therefore they got into the Lincoln bedroom because, as you know, this president, let me put it like this, maybe because I'm an immigrant to this country, I'm, I perhaps am too easily overcome with reverence, but it seems to me one of the things about Clintonism is that it's, a, it's profaned, it's blasphemed by turning the uh, Oval Office into a sort of cheap uh, massage parlor, the Lincoln bedroom into a sort of cheap motel for fat cats, and Arlington Cemetery into something that can be franchised for fundraising. Mr. Lawrence um, invented a war record for himself so that, he could, so that he could, along with a hefty donation, have himself buried in Arlington Cemetery and he and his wife appointed to uh, diplomatic positions and so on. When it was all discovered that this had been a fraud um, and that the money shouldn't really have been handed over anyway, he had to be dug up out of Arlington Cemetery and reburied. Now that would get me down if, uh, if I was some a patriotic American, which I can't claim to be. Um, and I was appalled and rather astonished that it didn't get people down, that 
that things that we're supposed to teach the children about, like the, the Lincoln bedroom, Mr. Lincoln's bedroom, for heaven's sake, used as a, as a motel, the O1 